to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. You who hate good and love evil. Micah chapter 3, verse number 2. Welcome to our study of the book of Micah. Among the minor prophets, Micah stands out for his prophecies of repentance, his prophecies of hope, and many of his prophecies that deal with the upcoming kingdom of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The name Micah is in itself an interesting name. Micah means, who is a God like you? And no doubt, as a prophet of God, he reminds people of the awesome nature and power of the God whom we serve. Micah preached at the same time as a contemporary. He preached at the same time, very difficult time, as Isaiah and Hosea encouraging the people not to get involved in further idolatry, to turn from their evil ways, or impending judgment would come from the Lord. Several important keys from the book of Micah can be identified. First, the key word is the word judgment. God is promising, He is assuring, He is encouraging His people that if they're not willing to change, judgment is indeed going to come from the Lord. They've been playing the harlot, as Hosea said. They've been messing with all the nations. They've been trying to flirt with the nations and be like them. And just as Isaiah warned, just as Hosea warned, Micah warns, judgment is indeed going to come from God. Key verse probably is Micah chapter 6, verse number 8. I want you to notice what this verse says. God says to the people, Micah says... He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God has shown people exactly what He wants. Men and women aren't ignorant of what it means to do good, Micah says. To love mercy, to do the right thing, and to walk humbly with our God. That's the key idea in the book of Micah. You know, when we find kind of a key phrase that identifies one of the major problems, it's found in Micah chapter 2, verse 3. God says, this is an evil time. What do you mean, God? Micah 3, verse 2. People love evil and hate good. They've got it backwards. People are living in sin and doing things that are contrary to God's will, and God is not at all impressed with that. Let's then turn our attention as we think about the book of Micah to some of those practical lessons that will help and encourage Christians. You know, Romans 15, 4 says this, and this is really the backdrop of many of our studies in the Old Testament series. The Scripture says in Romans 15, 4, the things that were written before time were written for our learning. What's that mean? That the Old Testament, although not the law that I'm going to be judged by or that I'm living under today, Ephesians 2, verse 14, and John 12, verse 48, does have powerful lessons that can help me learn about God and how God relates to man and wants man to relate to Him. And so what are some of those practical messages from the book of Micah? Here's the first. The Lord emphasizes throughout the book of Micah man's need to hear God's Word. Look in Micah chapter 1, and I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 2. To the people, God says, Hear all you peoples. 
Listen, O earth, and all that is in it. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from His holy temple. What is it that, that God is saying to the people? Listen up. Pay attention. Hear what I've got to say. Jesus knew the people had a hard time hearing His words in the first century. Luke 8, 18, Jesus said, Take heed what you hear. Mark chapter 4, verse 24, Take heed who you hear, how you hear. Uh, Revelation 2 and 3, Even to the Lord's church, Jesus would say every time, To him that has ears to hear, let him hear. We as God's people sometimes can grow hard in our hearing. We can stop our ears like they did in Acts chapter 7 when they heard the message of Stephen. Really what God's wanting is for us to be attentive when He speaks. We need to study the Scriptures daily to find out if what we're being told is true to the will of God. Who do I listen to? Jesus. Hear ye Him. Those are the words on the Mount of Transfiguration. Where do I go to hear the words of Jesus? the Bible, God has in these last days spoken to us through His Son. And friend, I have the responsibility and you have the responsibility not just to take what I hear and automatically buy into it, but to prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 21, to test the spirits to see whether they really are of God, 1 John 4, verses 1 through 4, and then to build my faith on the Word of God, which is that foundation that will not crumble and fail in the last day. And so, like in the days of Micah, there is a need to hear the Word of God and His powerful message. In the book of Micah, we also learn a very practical lesson, and it's this. We see the value of God's Word in the book of Micah to righteous people. Notice Micah chapter 2, verse number 7. The Scripture records for us in verse 7, You who are named the house of Jacob, is the Spirit of the Lord restricted? Are these His doings? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly. What do I learn about God's Word? It's good. It does good. It is good for the person who's trying to walk and live right. Friend, the Bible is God's revelation. It is one of God's greatest outside of the gift of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is one of the greatest gifts God has given man to help him in his journey. It's great because of its power. It's a living, powerful sharp, soul-piercing, soul-pricking book. Acts chapter 2, verse 37, Hebrews 4, verse 12. You know, I sometimes hear people say, the Word of God's a dusty, dead, 2,000-year-old book. No, it's not what the Bible says. Word of God is alive, powerful, is living and relevant to man's message and man's need today. It's powerful because it's God's power to save. Romans 1 verse number 16. The Word of God is as of such value to the upright because it's our direction in life. How do I know which way to go? How do I know how to make the right choice? How do I know what the Almighty wants me to do? The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 105, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. What else makes God's Word such a value to the upright? Friend, the Scripture tells us God's Word is a preventative to sin. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verses 10 through 12, Your Word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. How can the Word of God value me or be a value to me when I hide it in my heart? When I do what Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We need to be like Jeremiah, who in Jeremiah 15, 16 said, Your words were found, and I did eat them, and they were to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. Like in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah cried out, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And friend, we need 
to realize its power, listen carefully to its message, and apply it every day to our lives. What else do we learn from the book of Micah? Instead of doing like God's people who sometimes hated good and loved evil, we need to hate evil and love good. Notice Micah 3, verse number 2. The Scripture says, You who hate good and love evil, who strip the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, God goes on to say, I'm going to judge you for that. What were people doing in the days of Micah? God's enemies and even some of God's own people had it backwards. Instead of, of loving good and hating evil, which Christians are told to do in Romans chapter 12, we, they, were hating good and loving evil. Friend, I wonder just how far we are from that. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, they had it backwards. They weren't choosing the right thing. Romans 12, verse 21 tells us to hold to the good and to, to flee from the evil. But do we really do that morally, ethically, practically? Do we do that as a nation? Do we really do that? How much, you know, this nation, the United States of America, was founded upon the principle in God we trust. And it was founded on the Word of God, the Bible being the guide. Friend, do we really love that guide like we used to? When it comes to our moral decisions today, do we really love the Bible? D do we want to let this book, do we want to let this book decide when it comes to things like homosexuality? When it comes to things like immorality? When it comes to things like marriage and divorce? Abortion? Things of that nature? This is the good book. Do we really love the good or are we at a point where we sometimes spurn what it says and we actually despise what the Bible says and view it as a, a book that was prejudiced and against certain lifestyles? We too need to love the good and hate the evil, but I'm afraid that sometimes we do indeed have that backwards. Now, another very practical lesson we learn in the book of Micah relates to the foretelling of the coming of Christ's kingdom and exactly where that kingdom would be established. Look at Micah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us His ways. We shall walk in His paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. What exactly is this passage trying to say about the kingdom and the house of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, this can't be discussing the temple that previously existed because it's, it's still existing at the time of Micah's prophecy. And so, what is this house of God that according to Isaiah chapter 2, all nations are going to flow to? Well, friend, this is nothing other than the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and where it would be established. Now, please understand that according to 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15, the church of God is the house of God. And, and Jesus promised, promised in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, and prophesied that some of His disciples who were standing there present that day would be present when the kingdom came, that it would come during their lifetime. They would be present with power. And we see in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promised, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, did this house come into existence in Jerusalem? You bet it did. Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up with the eleven and proclaimed Jesus is Lord and Christ, 
Those who heard that word were cut in their heart. They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were baptized for the remission of their sins. And for the first time, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Just as was promised, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ came into existence in Jerusalem in the first century. Now let's make application to that text. If the Bible promised and prophesied that the Lord's church was going to be established in Jerusalem, then friend, religious groups or organizations that started thousands of years later, a thousand or more years later, and began maybe in Europe or America, don't fit that mold. The Lord's church, the church you read about in the book of Acts, the church that Christ promised to build, began in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost by the preaching of the gospel and by God adding people to that church. Now here's something else that's unique about the Lord's church. According to Isaiah chapter 2, and, and no doubt this would have caught every Jew's attention, God said all nations, not, not just Jews, all nations would flow to it. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden. Revelation 22, the, the echo, the cry goes out from the throne of God. Let whosoever will come and drink freely of the water of life. And so what a great and powerful prophecy about the beginning of Christ's kingdom in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. And what a privilege it is to be a part of the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we think, though, about Christ and about Him being that great Messiah, Micah chapter 5 tells us more about Jesus and a prophecy relating to Him. Notice Micah 5, beginning in verse number 2. The Bible says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. We read about here that one who is going to be ruler, the, the prince, the king, is going to come out of that little place, Bethlehem in the area of Ephrathah. Well, who is that? Well, what's going to happen here? We open our Bible to Matthew chapter 1. And as we read Matthew 1 and 2 about the family of Jesus and about their, their journey from Nazareth and about how that they were going while Mary was pregnant for the, 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 the census and the things that were going on there. Do you remember? Mary went into labor. And where was that little town and that little manger at? Bethlehem in Ephrathah. Just as was promised and prophesied by Scripture, Jesus was born in that place. Friend, this is proof positive and confirmation of the fact that Jesus is the Messiah that He meets the requirements set down by the old law. And if that's the case, then friend, He's the one we need to put our trust and hope in today. One of the most memorable passages in the book of Micah is Micah chapter 6, verse number 8. And look at the practical lesson it teaches us. God says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly? to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What does God require of us? What is it that God asks of me and you? God wants us to, to, to love mercy. That is, to be a, a merciful people that we're willing to extend, that we're willing to be kind and compassionate and loving and, and, and try to extend and share, no doubt, the mercy of God with others. Are we seen as compassionate? tender-hearted, caring, and merciful. That's how Christ was seen. 
He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He cast evil spirits out of those who were hurting. He, he was there during times of trouble and weakness for people. What a merciful Savior Jesus was, and He wants us to be the same thing. But not only to love mercy, but to actually do something. To do justly. Justice carries the idea of righteous or right or, or what God wants us to do. God wants us to do the right thing, to follow His teachings, and to realize that His book is the message of salvation and that we must follow it. And then, of course, to walk humbly with our God. To walk hand in hand with Christ means that I must humble myself, that I must have the mind of Christ, Philippians 2 verse 5, that I must realize that I am a sinner in need of the grace of God, Romans 3 verse 23, and that in and of myself I can't accomplish it. You know, a passage that gives us great humility, I think, is Luke 17, 10. Jesus said, And you, when you've done all those things commanded, you say, I'm an unfaithful servant. I've only done that which was my duty to do. Do I deserve? Have I earned? Have I merited any of the things God's... No. I only receive those by the grace of God. And friend, what humility. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may lift you up in due time. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 9. And of course, James chapter 5 as well. And then of course, we learn a very powerful lesson from the book of Micah about forgiveness. I want you to notice Micah chapter 7 verses 18 and 19. The scripture says in this text, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of His heritage? He does not retain His anger forever because He delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. As we said, the name Micah is a question. And that name is used as a play on words in Micah 7.18. Micah, who is a God like you? pardoning iniquity, looking over transgression, you will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. What do we know here and what do we learn about God? We learn here about the extent of God's forgiveness. Can I ask you, who in the world, who, when you think of the world's deities and the, the gods that men have tried to make, from the Egyptians to the Greeks to modern ones today, who's a god? like the God of the Bible. There is no comparison with the God of the Bible. What do you mean? Pardoning iniquity? Forgiving sin? Casting those into the depths of the sea? The Bible says in Psalm 103, verses 10 through 12, that the Lord has not dealt with man according to his sins, nor punished man according to his iniquity. What, what do we mean by that? As the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward us, as far as the east is from the west. So far has He removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? I don't know that they ever meet again. That's the idea. Casting all our sins into the depths of the sea. The furthest we know, the sea is some 30,000 feet, six, seven miles deep in some places. Where are my sins and yours at? If we could put it in a word picture, when God forgives sins, what's that like? It's like our sins have been cast into that big trench in the middle of the sea, not to be found again. I love the words of Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 12. God says, I'll be merciful to their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. God not only forgives, God forgets. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28? In instituting the Lord's Supper at the Passover, Jesus said, when he passed that fruit of the vine around, he said, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter 2.24 beautifully pictures it. He himself, Jesus himself, bore our sins in his own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. 
What is it that the book of Micah teaches us? Yes, it teaches us about judgment. And no doubt, there is a judgment day coming. There's a day coming when all who are in the graves will come forth. John 5, verse 28 and 29. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and chapter 10. But the good news is, those who've been washed in the blood of the Lamb, have had their sins removed. Revelation 1 verses 4 and 5. And on the judgment day, Christians, those who have lived faithful, those who have been by the grace of God are saved, can hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. Matthew 25. Is there going to be another alternative? Oh, you bet there is. And it's a very sad one. And it's one that God doesn't want. And we don't want people to have to hear. A friend, those who don't, do not obey Jesus, those who do live and die in sin, will hear these sad words. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Like the appeal of Micah, our appeal out of love to you today is to make sure, to check, to, to look into your own life and really see, am I ready for judgment? Am I a part of that kingdom Christ set up? Have I obeyed the Messiah, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If not, why not do that today? Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you believe in Jesus and you're willing to change your life and Make that confession before men, Acts chapter 8, verse 37 through 39. Friend, why not be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? And may God help each of us as we study His will to really live every day for the Messiah in view of that coming judgment. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.